Open up your Bibles, if you would, please, to Exodus. Exodus. How many has got a little bit more room in you for the Word today? <clears throat> Exodus chapter 34. And we're just going to read a couple verses from there, and then we're going to jump back over into the New Testament. Exodus 34, verse number 23. And it reads like this. And three times a year, all your males, or your men. Somebody shout the men. All your men are to appear before the Lord your God, the God of Israel. For I will drive out the nations before you. I'm going to enlarge your borders. And no man shall covet your land when you go up there three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. Notice that God was given a command, an instruction to all the men of Israel in this particular time that three times a year they were to come up before the Lord and worship him. They were to come up to the place of worship and give God honor and give God praise. And he said when all the men came up, when all the men came up and they began to worship, God said, then I'm going to step in and I'm going to fulfill my promises to you and I'm going to drive out your enemies. I'm going to enlarge your borders and I'm going to make sure nobody gets what I have promised you. There's something about when the men, all the women, y'all going to have to help me because you know the men are a little quiet. There's something about when the men rise up. When the men, this is not, a, this is not against the ladies because we thank God for the ladies. <laughs> It was the ladies who believed the report of the Lord long before the men did. It was the ladies who made it to the tomb of Jesus long before the men got there. So we thank God for the ladies. The ladies are not unimportant. They are equally as important. But there's something about when men. Y'all can kind of see where I'm going here for a moment. All right, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. I feel like preaching today if you feel like listening. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 13. And be on the alert. Stand firm in your faith. Act like men. <laughs> be strong. And let all that you do, let it be done in love. Very powerful words by the Apostle Paul. He gives these charges, these commands. He said, be on the alert. Stand firm in your faith. And for God's sakes, act like men. <laughs> I don't know if I should announce the title that I felt or I should just go with what I wrote down. I think I'll just go with what I wrote down. Normally, I would save a message like this on Father's Day. But since on Father's Day, none of the men show up, I'm going to catch you off guard today. <laughs> on Mother's Day, it's easy. Mother's Day, all the women come on Mother's Day. That's going to be a good Sunday next Sunday. But today, <laughs> we're going to talk to the men. See that? Dead silence. You see that? Like all the men went, oh my God, nothing, nothing. I want to talk to you this morning about modern day heroes. We need some modern day heroes. Push on about three people around you and tell them we need some modern day heroes. Come on, just find a man around you and tell them we need some family heroes. Come on, just tell them we need some family heroes. <clears throat> we need some family heroes. Father, this morning, I thank you and I give you praise for what you're going to do in this place. Holy Spirit, you're the preacher, you're the teacher, you're the revealer of all truth. Thank you today for what you're going to do in men and women's hearts. And we give you all the glory and all the honor and the praise for it in advance. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody together said amen, amen. and amen and amen. God bless you this morning. You can be seated in the name of the Lord. <coughs> Several years ago, I had a take my truck up to Jimmy's Tire Center here in Clueston and, uh, to get some new tires. And uh, my truck is about 14 years old, so it's, 
it's in need of a of a restoration. <laughs> and uh, and I, I took it up there a couple years ago because it needed some new shoes. It needed some new tires. And uh, because the old tires had wore out, obviously. And uh, he discovered, Jimmy told me this when I went back up there, he discovered that the old tires had been not wearing out properly. They were not wearing out as they should. And he said to me, the reason why the tires are not wearing out in the manner like they should is because the bushings on your stabilizers are gone and it's keeping your front end out of alignment. It won't stay in line. And I've got a big four-wheel drive truck, obviously, got a lift kit on it. And so I got, you know, I got all the bells and whistles when it comes to that. So my stabilizer bar, my, my bushings on the end of it were completely shot because how many you know every now and then I like to sneak off into the woods? <laughs> and that'll beat your truck up a little bit. But uh, anyway, they, it, the bushings were gone, and it wouldn't keep the truck aligned. And because there was no alignment, the tires were wearing out way too soon. Because there was no alignment, the tires was wearing out way too soon, and I wouldn't get the mileage out of the tire that I should have been getting. And even though they were putting new tires on it, if it didn't get in alignment, if I didn't deal with the alignment issue, if I didn't deal with the alignment and get it resolved, it was gonna have unnecessary wear and tear on the new tires. So when I was thinking about that the other day, and I look around our world today as it relates to the family, and in particular, to the biblical order of manhood, we find out that there is an alignment problem. We have an alignment problem. Many men are out of alignment. Many men are out of alignment in our culture today, and they are wearing out, and the wear and tear is showing up way too early. And one of the ways that you can tell that a culture is in trouble is when men are hard to find. You can always tell when a culture has shifted for the worse when the men are no longer present. In fact, if you read in Isaiah chapter 3, you find out that there's a, there's a, there's a portion of scripture in there, and it begins in verse number 12. When Judah was coming under the judgment of God during Isaiah's day, and it was because things were out of alignment, and Isaiah 3 speaks about the judgment of God on the land because the children had come in control of the adults, and women were in control of the men. <laughs> None of you going to get an amen from the women now. <laughs> So, so, so the inversion, the inversion was a reflection of a judge culture because men were hard to find, because men were out of alignment. And I point this out to you because in our text that we read there in Exodus chapter 20, 34, it says three times a year God would call the men before the Lord. The men, all the males in the camp of Israel were called to appear before the Lord their God. Why did God just summon the men? Why did God just put an emphasis on the males? Here's the answer, because God holds the men responsible. It's the responsibility of the man to lead the family. Got some good amens over here. It's silent on this side. God holds the men responsible for the way of the family. And until they were willing, talking about the men in our text now, until they were willing to submit to authority that was above them, they would never be the man that God created them to be because they were out of alignment. They were not in line with the things of God. 
And the reason why God called them together three times a year was to make sure that the men would stay in alignment. He said, I'm going to bring you up to the mountain of my presence. I'm going to bring you up to the place of my presence. And I'm going to bring you up there three times a year so that you can know that as long as your life is in alignment, as long as you are under spiritual authority, you will always be able to lead your family successfully. And God says, I'm just going to put a reminder on you that three times a year you're going to come with all your male children, all the men, all the boys, all the teenagers. Bring all the males to this place of worship as a, as a reminder that if you don't stay under authority, you will never have no authority. So, 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 so the alignment that God is talking about It flows directly out of our willingness to submit to God's authority over us. Just track with me for a minute. I want to preach in a minute. I want to make sure we got on the same page right here. Our text challenges every male to stay in God's divine order of alignment and to stay fully committed to God, not just in word, but in action. We don't need just a lot of men who talk a good game. We need some men who can play the game. We don't need just some men who can quote the right scriptures at the right time. We need some men who can live out the scripture that they're quoting. We don't just need Facebook prophets. We need some demonstrations. We need some realities. We need a model. We need something we can point to. We need something that we can touch. We need a tangible proof and evidence that you are the man that you say you are. He said, you got to bring them to me. I hear men, because in my, my line of work, I hear men all the time complain to me that, They say, well, my wife won't submit to me. (laughs) Well, the question is, how come? The question is, how come? Who are you submitted to? What do you model? This will be on the screen for you if you got nerve to take notes today. The problem is, when you're not accountable to anybody, you have no credibility. All the men are ducking their heads. I don't know what's going on in the, in the atmosphere today. <laughs> when, when, when you're not accountable to anybody, you have no credibility. You, you can't demand submission when you're not willing to model submission. Check it on the mic one, two. If you're not willing to model a life of submission to God, then don't get mad when your wife don't want to follow. Even Jesus, in his earthly manhood, understood the model of submission. The Bible says that he was submitted to his father. In fact, in John chapter 5, verse number 19, Jesus says, I can only do what I see my father do. So if my father don't do it, then I can't do it. In other words, I'm, not, I'm only going to do what I see my father do. Come on, man. That's a, that's, that's a message to the men. Your children will do what you do. Good or bad, they're going to follow you. They're going to follow you. And you know what? If you're not submitted to God, if your heart is not going after God, then you're going to lead your children down a path that they may never recover from. That's why we got to have men, and I know I'm challenging you today, but I'm telling you, I'm tired of the world having entrance into the church. We need a church that understands we got some men in this house, and we got some men that know how to be men. We have some men that know how to be godly. I don't need nobody to teach my children the word. I don't need nobody to teach my family how to pray. I am the man of my house. God has authorized me. God has deputized me. I may not pray that good. I may not sound that good. It may not even be all. 
all theologically, theologically correct. But at the end of the day, I love Jesus. Jesus loves me. And I'm going to lead my family in the best way that I know how. Come on, push, some, um, push on somebody and tell them we need some heroes now. Come on, tell them. Come on, find a man that's just sitting around you. Push on them, make them feel good. Tell them we need you. We need some heroes. We need some heroes. If Jesus was so perfect, and he was, who had no flaws, no sin, no character issues, yet he still had to be submitted to the Father, how much more? Do we need submission in our life? Let me say it this way. I believe that one of the reasons why men, I'm just going to pick on our area, our territory, our region. The reason why men are not coming to church is because the church has been feminized. The church has lost its masculinity, and it has become weakened in its role towards society. We have neutered the men. <laughs> we have become weakened. We sing songs. That says, I want to make love to Jesus. No man in his right mind can put his mind on that dimension of worship. Because they know Jesus as a man. Y'all not going to help me, but I'm going to preach my message today. I'm going to preach it out today. And we sing songs about just having this love cycle with Jesus and, and, and y'all know what I mean and there's nothing wrong with that stuff but I'm telling you as a man as a man as a man thinks in his mind that does not compute to him because men were born to conquer men were born to overcome men were born to do battle men were born to take on the powers of hell and say this is what I'm going to do for my family I don't let my wife take the javelins of the devil I'll step in front of my family because men were built to conquer so when you have churches that begin to water everything down and watch this now because we build our churches that facilitate women and children not the men I'm just saying we need a revolution of men there needs to be a call there needs to be a call not, 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 not just men to the church but we need a call for the church to come back to men Come on, talk to me up in here. We, 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 need, we need the church to be what it needs to be. And we need, we, now ladies, y'all know I'm not against y'all because God knows we need y'all. I mean, we, we, the, the ladies are the faithful ones, right? And, and we, we need the ladies on board. But at the end of the day, if, if the men were at the same level of spiritual commitment as their wives... We would take this region by storm. Because here it is. When you, stu when you study when you study other religions in the world, when you study Islam, when you study Judea Ju Ju Judaism, Hinduism, or even Buddhism, bo 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 booty? <laughs> Buddhism, when you get that booty call, you know what I'm talking about? When you get that Buddhism. All these other religions, all these other religions, out, the, the, the women are not outnumbering the men. In all these other religions, men outnumber the women. Only in Christianity do we have women outnumbering the men. When it comes to spiritual matters... Children have always had a desire to follow their fathers. Boys follow men, and men follow men. All throughout history, no religion has prospered without the participation and the leadership of men. No other religion has prospered without the participation 
Not only, y'all just, are y'all doing all right? Yeah. I'm trying to get there. Only, not only is there an absence of men, but there's an absence of what I've called manly men. Men who act like men. And don't try, to, don't try to put that in one little box because Jesus had a, a, a wide view of what a man should look like. It, it, you don't have to be a hunter. You don't have to be a fisherman. You don't have to be an outdoorsman. Jesus has a wide view. You, you can be techie. You can know how to cook. I'm not, I'm not, don't, don't, don't stereotype what a man looks like in your own mind. I'm just saying at the end of the day, you still have to be a man. This has become the issue in our churches because when you read the Bible, you find out that the men in the Bible acted like men. (laughs) They were risk takers. They were adventurous. They were warriors. They were not afraid to do something for the glory of God. And some of these men were rough. And tough and hard to look at. But they had a desire to walk with the Lord. They had a desire to be in submission to the Lord. And because they had that desire to be in submission to the Lord, God says, I can use that one. Doesn't matter what your background is. Doesn't matter where you came from. Doesn't matter how much scripture you know or may not know. God says, if you have a heart for me, I'm going to use you. If you have a heart after me, I'm going to make sure that your family gets blessed to the thousandth generation. If you have a heart for me, God says, not only will I go before you, but I'll become your rear guard. I'll step to the side of you, and I'll make sure that the enemy doesn't come in like a flood. Because when he does, I, the Lord, will raise the standard against him. Because when you have a heart after me, because when you are in alignment with me, God says, I will fight your enemies. I will expand your borders, and I will renew my covenant to you every day. That's the picture of a man in the Bible. And somehow or another in our 21st century America, we have reduced men down. Jesus handpicked some guys, and he didn't just handpick just anybody. He would handpick guys, and some of these guys were tough. Some of them were rough, and Jesus even made it tough. For a man to follow him. Because Jesus would say, follow me. And then he'd turn around and walk away. No follow-up program. He'd say, just follow me. No follow-up program. We're not going to send you a text and invite you back to church. Just follow me. Just get in the game. Just just, just have a heart after me. I'm not going to send you no emails. There's not going to be somebody coming to your house with, with, with some brownies. Only in America do we have these follow-ups to get people to serve Jesus. Y'all not going to help me, but I'm going somewhere. Because, ladies and gentlemen, here's the way I saw it. When I got saved, when I got born again, I didn't need a follow-up program to serve God. I didn't need nobody to remind me it's church on Sunday and church on Wednesday. When I got born again, there was something ignited inside my heart that made me burn. It made me burn to the core of my being. I wanted to please God. I wanted to follow God. I wanted to know Him. Only in America do we reduce it down to, well, just serve him when you feel like it. Praise him when you got a crisis. <laughs> Jesus would say, come on and follow me. And then he'd turn around and walk away, indicating I'm on a mission. If you want to get on board with me, I'm not getting on board with you. You got to get on board with me. Now, see, some of you men are quiet, but y'all know this is the truth and you can handle this. You know I'm preaching the truth, and the men, the men ain't saying nothing, but they know it's right. <laughs> They're like, yeah, preach on. That's what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. At least for now. When Jesus called men to follow him, he didn't take away their masculinity. Because Jesus understood, I need their masculinity to get the job done. 
He needed men. Nothing against the women. Come on, ladies, help me out. Y'all know I love you. We're on it. We're on the same page, ladies. Come on, just one big shout, amen. amen. Thank you. Elbow that guy next to you and say, get on with it now. Here we go. <laughs> Jesus understood it takes men to expand the kingdom because men are wired different. <laughs> Women like to cuddle. Men want to conquer. Women like to shop. Men develop pain at the point of shopping. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> I'm meddling now. I better stick to my notes. Let me stick to my notes. <laughs> he needed men to expand the kingdom, and Jesus understood that I can't take away their masculinity if we're going to push the kingdom down the road a little further. Men follow Jesus, and men got connected to Jesus. Watch this. Not for religion, but for a cause. Men got connected to Jesus not because they could just sing a little bit. Men didn't get connected to Jesus so we could have a good worship service, a good church service. Men got connected to Jesus because they understood he's on a mission. I want to be a part of that mission. And if nothing else, part of that mission is to take everything that God has put in my influence, that God has put everything in my sphere of influence, is to lead my family into the same mission that he's on. God's not calling you, maybe he is, but God's not calling you to preach, pray, and prophesy. God's not calling you into full-time ministry. Maybe he is. Praise God if he does. But at the end of the day, you are called, man. You are called, mister. You are called, and you are called to be who God created you to be, and you are called to do exactly what God called you to do. It don't, mean, it, don't mean, it don't matter what your job title is. It doesn't matter what your function is. At the end of the day, you are called to lead yourself, and you are called to lead those that are tacking along behind you because God has appointed you to be that prophet, priest, and king over your house. If you've got problems in your house, quit blaming it on the devil and take inventory of your life and say, I allowed something to come in here. I opened the door to something, and it's my responsibility to shut the door. Come on, push on somebody and tell them we need some men now. We need some men. Men follow Jesus because they understood there's a cause. It's not just a religion. It's not just religious calisthenics. That's, that's what's different. That's what I love about what, what we do at New Harvest Church. We're not just trying to have church services. Man, we're invading every sphere of our territory that we can. There's people on their jobs out there. I mean, they, they're, they're like a John the Baptist on their job. They're saying, repent, turn, and burn, baby. It's going, something's going to happen. I mean, we just got people scattered up because we understand we're, we're not just trying to have a cute little church service. No, no, this is the least that we'll ever do. We're not just trying to have some little cute little church service on a Sunday morning. We are called to invade territory and let the devil know, as long as I'm here, you can't be here. As long as I'm walking in this land, you don't have a right to be in this land. And when men understand their authority and who they are in Christ, woo, walk on your job. Do what you got to do. Go to school. Whatever you got to do. Make your money. Do your business. Do whatever you got to do. But understand, I'm on a mission. And I'm paving a way for my generations to come behind me. Woo. Glory to God. Look with me in Luke chapter 9. Y'all got time for a scripture here? I do have a bunch of scriptures. I don't think I'm going to have time to get to them all. Luke chapter 9. When Jesus was trying to get somebody to follow him. He didn't play. In fact, he says it's going to cost you everything you got. Right. Men understand that. Men understand that. Listen, if I'm going to get in this game, listen, I, back in the day when I played sports, when I was a little younger, and not everything hurt. <laughs> I told Savannah in the 
the, the green room this morning, which they're talking about exercise. And he said, you know, exercise and all that stuff. And I said, listen, I live in a perpetual state of soreness. <laughs> Nothing ever goes away now. It's like you just wake up sore. So you just go throughout the day. But, but when, I, when I was younger and involved in sports, and I love sports, been involved in it my whole life, I never got into a game just to get by. I mean, even when I was doing professional arm wrestling, I never went up to the podium thinking, well, I'm just going to get by. I, I, I'm, not just going to, I'm, not, I'm not just going to say, okay, okay, let's, let's just see what you got. No, I went up there with an attitude in my heart, not really to do it, but in an attitude in my heart, I'm going to break your arm. That's right. <laughs> I'm gonna break, I'm gonna, uh, you're, you're, they're going to be calling 911. Now, that wasn't like, like I didn't really want to do that, but, but that was my attitude. I guess it was what I really wanted to do because that was my attitude. Like, like I, want you, I want you to feel what I'm about to put. I'm about to put power on you like you've never seen before. Of course, they had the same thought. And they put power on me like I ain't never seen before. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you this quick story. Y'all got time for one? Uh, just one little story. It won't be long. Just one little story. I, I remember... Because in arm wrestling, you had this podium and all this kind of stuff here. And so they'd give you these numbers when you sign in. You get these numbers. And then you would wrestle your opponents based on the numbers that they drew out of the hat, the bag, or whatever. And so let's say I'm number 17, whatever. So I get up there. They call me up to the podium. I'm up there first. And I'm like, I'm getting all ready, you know, just doing my thing. And out from the back, they call like number 12, whatever the number was. And this guy stood up from the back of that auditorium. Full of people, four or five hundred people there. All these guys, arm wrestlers. Arm wrestlers are jacked up. They're weird. Whatever arm they wrestle with looks way bigger than their other arm. I mean, they're just weird guys, okay? I mean, if you ever seen that movie Over the Top with Rock, uh, uh, Sylvester Stallone, you ever seen that movie? Some of y'all need to, some of y'all need to be born again. <laughs> it, it, I mean, that, that's really the reality. So this guy stands up in the back of the auditorium and he starts screaming. <laughs> I mean, just with everything he got. And then literally, I'm a, I'm a born-again Christian. I've been a Christian for a long time at that point. He stands up, and I thought, oh, my God, this man's demon-possessed. <laughs> this man is demon. And he starts coming down the aisle, like here, the center aisle. He's going, rah, rah. I mean, he's just like, it's like demons are manifesting on their way to me. I mean, it's, I'm, a, I, I'm not saying it happened, but it looked like his head spun around one time. It really looked like his head went around one time. And he's just coming, and he's screaming, and he's hollering. He gets up to the podium, and we're up like this, and he grabs my arm, and he's going, rah, rah. He's just snapping up, and the referee's going like that. I'm like, cannot you do something? Can you help calm him down? And he's just screaming. And I thought to myself at that time, I read in Mark chapter 5 that the man in the tombs that had the demons chains couldn't hold him I thought if demons couldn't hold chains what's this man going to do to my arm <laughs> but he so intimidated me out of what I had been trained to do he so intimidated and broke my focus on who I was and what I was about that I didn't even hear the referee say go I mean, went phew, just like that, match over. And then he goes, good match. I was, oh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> but whatever I got involved in, I'm not, I know it's like that for many of you men out there. Whatever you get involved in, you give it everything you got. You don't just go half-heartedly into it because you'll never be successful that way. I love to hunt. When I go to the woods, I ain't going to the woods to look at animals. I'm going to the woods to kill an animal. I'm on a mission to hunt. And I give it every. You can ask my wife. I give it everything I got. I go after it. When I was in sports, it didn't matter. Whatever the job assignment was, I gave it everything I got. That is the mission of men. Men understand that until we get to church. Then we just say, we'll, we'll let the women handle that. It's out of alignment. You're not lined up. You got to get lined up. You got to get lined up because our children are at stake. Our homes are at stake. Okay, Luke chapter 9. Is that, are you there? Did I tell you that scripture? Okay, Luke chapter 9, verse number 57. We're, we're about to close here. I ain't going to get done. 
Verse number 57, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, talking to Jesus, now he says, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You know what Jesus was saying to this guy? He was saying, it's easy to say I'm going to follow you, but there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of uncertainties. And, and, and if you're going to follow me, that means you got to learn how to deal with what is uncertain. you, you got to learn how to deal with where you don't know how this may turn out. But at the end of the day, you still got to be following me. Okay? Then, then he said, well, he goes on to say to Foxhole, verse number 59, then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go bury my father. Look at Jesus. Woo. This ain't church 101 right here. This ain't how to win friends and influence people right here. He said, let the dead bury the dead. But as for you, you go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of heaven. Notice, now watch this. He said, Lord, I'll follow you. Sounds reasonable, right? Sounds reasonable. But he wasn't asking. This man wasn't asking if he could go bury the dead. He wasn't asking if he could go to a funeral. He was referring to a future death. Of his father. He just wanted to make sure that after he received his father's inheritance, when everything was secure, then I'll follow you. And Jesus is saying, I don't need you to have your security in order because I become your security. There's a difference, there's a difference between knowing Jesus. And being a disciple of Jesus. And the call to the kingdom is not some future day. Come on, men. The call to the kingdom is right here, right now. It's not some future time. It's not when it's more convenient. Well, I'm going to... Kids, go to college. Well, I'll serve God when I get out of college. You're going to waste three or four years of your life disconnected from God? You know what the enemy will do to your life? Well, I'm going I'm to go to church when I get all my ducks in a row. Are you kidding me? Your ducks will never be in a row. In fact, if we took a survey of everybody in this building today, they would tell you right now, my ducks ain't in a row. There ain't nothing in my life that's properly like. Everything in my life is a mess. Everything in my life is crazy right now. But I didn't serve God so I could be conveniently gifted. I served God so that I could follow after God. So that at the end of the day, everything that's in trouble around me becomes full of peace with God in it. Come on, give God praise if you believe that right there. Then he goes on to say, to another guy in verse number 61, he says, I will follow you, but first let me, permit me to say goodbye to those at my house. And Jesus looks at him and says, hey, you know what, go on back home. Because no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looks back, is fit Amen. for the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was dealing with the double-mindedness of this man. He was compared to a man, like a farmer plowing a field. Any farmer that knows, and there's a bunch of them in here, that when you're plowing a field or when you're cutting a field, you can't just keep looking back because you're going to have crooked lines. you got to stay focused on what is in front of you. And if you keep looking back, you're going to stay undecided. In other words, don't worry. About, don't, don't put your hands to the plow and look back. Put your hands to the plow and look straight ahead. To follow Jesus, you have to get off the fence. Even family relationships, this is going to hurt some of y'all because y'all going to put it in a religious category, but even family relationships become secondary to your loyalty to Jesus. And that is out of alignment. If God's not first, then where is he? Well, it's my family first and then God. No, you're out of alignment. If you put God first, then your family. Amen. So the goal of God, this will be on the screen for you, is not merely your salvation, but your discipleship. Every society, every society needs men. 
because every society needs men and people who understand dangerous jobs. Yeah. It's not that the women don't do dangerous jobs. I, I know you do. But from the majority standpoint, all throughout human history, it was the men who had to go off and fight wars. It was the men who had to travel long distances without the comforts of home and stay in danger. It was the men who did it. I know we got women that do things, and I'm not talking about that. I, I do have my own personal preference, but I, I don't think women should be in combat. That's my personal preference. Because a man's job, when you put a woman next to a man in combat, the first thing he's going to do is try to protect her. And you can mess up the whole mission because you're just trying, because that's what a man does. He protects. I don't believe, I believe women can serve in major capacities, high capacities. But to get on the fighting line, I just think it's out of order. That's just my opinion. That's not the Bible. You can just throw it right out and it ain't going to matter. Amen. Because men were built to handle it. 94% of occupational deaths occur with men. Most people that die in wars are men. Men sign up for wars because they understand the cost. I'll give it my all. If I die on the battlefield, then I die on the battlefield. For society to survive and for civilization to thrive, you've got to have men that know how to rise. You've got to have men. Let me give you a couple things here because we're running out of time really quick. Let me submit to you this morning why churches struggle to attract men. Men are attracted to the things that connect with the way they're wired. Every young boy growing up starts out in life, at least the majority of them, start out in life with dreams of being a hero. Every young boy wants to save the planet at least once. Every young boy dreams about beating up the bad guy. I get tickled with my grandsons, Vanessa and Carlos' kids, and even um, Brittany and Vanessa's, the, the younger one, Grayson, because everything's cops and robbers now. Everything's going to jail now. I'm like, they come in, Papa, you going to jail? What did I do? You bad guy. Like everything, everything, you know, then, then, then Maddox wants to come up and do a karate chop across my throat. <laughs> like, seriously. You know, it's like everything's got to get, I got to get beat up now. And I'm just, I'm, I'm watching this. I'm watching, I'm watching these young men fantasize about their calling. I'm watching them live out the dream. Of every young man, every young man, if, they, if they're involved in sports, every young man wants to hit the final home run and win the game. Every young man wants to catch the winning touchdown pass with the final few seconds left on the clock. Every young man, or it don't matter if you don't like sports, every young man, if you like cooking, every young man wants to fix the finest meal that anybody has ever tasted. Got some fishermen, Brandon, Scott, all these guys. Over. Every young man wants to catch the biggest fish. <laughs> Pastor Mark keeps trying. <laughs> but every young man has a dream of winning the pretty woman. Every young man wants to be a James Bond. Okay, a Jason Bourne. Okay, a Superman or a Batman. Wherever you're at in your lifespan. Every young man wants to have that. And for a boy, it's a dream. But for a man, it's a reality. Because every man in his heart wants to be a hero. Every man in his heart, it don't, I'm not talking about for the world. Praise God if that happens. But every man in his heart, at least I want to be a hero for my wife. At least I want to be a hero for my children. At least I want to be a hero for my grandchildren. I, every man has a desire to be something. 
That's why when Jesus said, listen, if you take up your cross and fall after me, it's going to cause you death, pain. It's going to rip your guts out. You're going to go through trials and tribulation and trauma. It's going to cost you everything you got. And these men were saying, sign me up. Sign me up because I'm built for this. I'm made for this. I'm designed for this. Don't let me sit on the sideline and watch everybody else get engaged in the game. Let me pull my sword out and let me fight the good fight of faith. Every man has that desire. Okay, so real quick so we can close. First Corinthians, our text said, be on the alert, stand firm in your faith. And he said, act like men. How many, how many guys have been into the men's bathroom over here? You've been in there like, like two of y'all. The rest of boy, y'all got some, y'all, y'all hold it good. <laughs> if you go in there, if you go in there, if you go in there, there's a scripture on the wall. It's a scripture that I just quoted. Months ago, my wife came to me, maybe a month ago, my wife came to me. She said, hey, I need a, I need a scripture for the bathroom wall for the men. Oh, yeah. Let's put a scripture for the men on the bathroom wall. Every time they go to the bathroom, let them see the word. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking in my heart. Yeah. Why you're doing your thing. Walk out of there and read the word. <laughs> so the scripture I put on the bathroom wall was, be firm in your faith and act like men. In other words, don't pee on the toilet seat. Don't pee on the side of the walls. Little kids running there, just peeing there. What are you, you crazy? You lost your dang mind. Get out of here. <laughs> be strong. Be firm in the faith. Be alert. Be guardful. And act like men. Ugh. Every man in here can, 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 I mean, you feel that, don't you? Okay, maybe I'm the only man in here that feels that. Like, act like a man. I mean, if, if, if you had a, a decent upbringing, like, like where there wasn't a whole lot of trauma and you had a father that was in home, you, your, your dad would say, son, you better straighten up. <laughs> you know, nowadays we don't, we don't talk to kids like that because we don't want to hurt them. So we put them over there in time out so we can watch them while they in time out so you can't do nothing. No, no, when I grew up, it was like my dad had this belt. And then when he couldn't find a belt, he'd say, Craig, Chuck, Chet, go cut a switch. What? Go cut a switch. I know today, today's world is too sensitive. I got it. Everybody's sensitive. And you wonder why we have lost our masculinity in the church. Because what most of these kids need is not a good talk to. They need a good butt whoop. They just need a good whoop. Just like Whoop, get back up and get in line. Get in line. <laughs> I feel it. I feel, I feel that. Oh, my God. Child abuse. Uh, I, I hear it. Okay, so let me just give you these three things, then we're going to run on home, okay? What does it mean to act like a man? Number one, act like a man. Number one, don't act like a woman. Went real deep on you right there, didn't I? <laughs> to act like a man means you don't act like a woman. Don't mack it. Go on down there to the bathroom. There it is. Just go on. Read the wall when you walk out. He's going to kill me later. I know. <laughs> act like a man means I don't act like a woman. Men have built within them this gift by God. They're anointed for responsibility. You're anointed for accountability. And you're anointed to lead your family. Most, most men that have a desire to serve God don't mind being held accountable to their actions. I, I, got, I got guys, men in my life, Karen knows, I got men in my life. I've had them in my life ever since I've been in the ministry, I've had men, some of them don't even live here. They live in other cities. They're well-known ministers. They've got multiple thousands of people. Uh, they hold me accountable in my life. They hold me accountable with my money. They hold me accountable with my finances. They hold me accountable with my marriage. And they can call me at any given time of the day or the night and say, how are you treating your wife? Because when you're following after God, you want accountability. And men have built within them the ability to be held accountable. Because how are you going to hold somebody else accountable when you're not accountable? 
Okay, let me break it. How are you going to discipline your children when you won't be disciplined? Okay. The only reason why the serpent in the garden had access to Eve is because Adam didn't do his job. We always blame it on Eve. Well, that woman. That's what Adam said. Well, Lord, it's that woman you gave me. God said, no, I ain't, you, I ain't buying that, Adam. I ain't buying that. You're responsible. Adam didn't do his job. If Adam would have stepped up and did his job, how many of things would have been a whole lot different today? Men, it's your responsibility to step up in that relationship. Step up in that marriage. Take the lead. When my children were little living in our house, even to this day, if I see somebody in my influence as a pastor, even people in this church, if I see them going a certain way and I know about it, I'm going to step in. And I'm going to say, you, gotta, you, you can't act like that. Well, my, my, when my children were trying to go certain ways, I, we, Karen and I would step in and we'd go, no, uh, this, you, we're going to pull you back over here. Because left to themselves, come on, Eve. Less to yourself, you can mess a whole lot of stuff up. Men don't act like women. Men are called to lead their families spiritually, emotionally, physically. All right, men, we're called to lead them to church. We don't send them. We take them. We teach them how to have a relationship with the Lord. And you don't have to start out knowing anything. Just have a heart for Him. Because sometimes modeling is the best teacher outside when you don't have words to say. That's why Paul said it this way. Hey, you just follow me as I follow Christ. I don't have to explain it. Just watch what I do. You're going to be all right. Let me give you number two because we're running out. I got a whole bunch of stuff there on the women, but y'all get it, right? Y'all going to make me say it? <laughs> Let me just say this one thing. The reason why men need to act like men is because we live in a time where major corporations like Disney are trying to do away with gender. In fact, Disney just announced several weeks ago that they were going to get 50% of all their cartoons and movies, and they're going to do away with little boys and little girls saying little boys and little girls because they want to be gender-friendly, gender-neutral. Even when you go into Disney now, they train their staff not to say, hello, boys and girls. They just train them to say, hey, what a good day. They won't even address you as a boy or girl. Yeah, keep spending your money on Disney. Empower the devil. That's what you do. On March the 31st, just a couple of weeks ago, even it's, it's been in play for the last couple of years, but the Biden administration announced that the annual holiday as Transgender Day of Visibility. March the 31st is a national holiday, or a holiday. I don't know if it's national yet. It's a holiday for Transgender Day of Visibility. They went on, he went on to even put in place a four-star openly transgender health official for public health service. I'm just trying to tell you the devil's not hiding nothing. The devil is coming after the masculinity of our children. Even on passports now, you have a place where you can mark an X instead of checking male or female. The X means I'm neither. That's what's going on in our world. You know, why, you, you know why we need men to rise up? Because if you don't teach your young children who they are, I'm telling you, the world will school them really good. And the world will make it acceptable. The world will make it okay. Last month, the Biden administration announced that they endorsed sex change surgery and hormone therapy for children. Yeah. What has happened to parental rights? I 
I know this is a little tough on a Sunday morning, but I'm just trying to let you know, men, we're in a war. And we don't need you AWOL. We don't need you skipping around, doing what you feel led to do. You need to be up in here driving your family to an answer. And understand, I'm not mad at nobody. I mean, we got people that are struggling with all kinds of things in here. I'm not mad at nobody. I'm not after that. I'm, a, I'm, I'm just a spirit. Listen, it's just a spirit. And, and I agree with, with our governor, Ron DeSantis, when he says, we will make sure that parents can send their kids to school to get an education and not an indoctrination. I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that. Our kids from kindergarten to third grade don't need to be taught that there are more than two genders. They don't need to be taught that. There's, 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 there's just two genders. There's not more genders. You're born male or female. Come on, talk to me in here. And I'm not picking on, I'm just saying that's the word of God. I'm just trying to preach the word of God. And this is the problem. When men understand this is the word of God, men rise up. Women follow. Children get in line. Next thing you know, you're blazing a path in a region, in a territory that lets the devil know you don't get to come up in here. You don't get to say what you want to say because we have a method. We have a mission and we have a savior. Come on, give him praise if you believe that. Just in case you didn't know, our kids don't belong to the state and they don't belong to the federal government. My kids are not going to be used as guinea pigs on some sort of experiment. My kids, I will teach my kids what sex and sexuality is. I don't need some jack leg off the wall school teacher who's struggling with their own identity to tell me that it's okay if I'm a boy to feel like I'm a girl. I know, I know, I know. See, that we, we have been so indoctrinated by the culture that for preachers to even say things like this, it's like, oh, can't believe you're going down that road. It's at stake. Okay, let me give you, let me, he said, don't act like, don't, men, act like men, don't act like women. First Peter 3, 7, men, treat your wives as weaker vessels. It's not that the women are weaker. But you see them in a light that you are the one that's anointed. For. That means don't act like an animal. <laughs> I went a little deeper on your own that one, didn't I? Don't act like an animal. Animals care for their own desires. Animals don't care what you think. Oh, you mean really they don't know what I'm thinking? No, they probably don't. I feel that one too. Animals only care about their needs, their wants, their appetites, their desires. Animals can be cruel. Animals can be unkind. I had a dog that was unforgiven. <laughs> I did. I had a dog that straight went to hell when it died. <laughs> it did. It did. It went straight to hell. It didn't even pass go and collect two hundred dollars. It went straight to hell. <laughs> Back when my girls were little, they had these little blow-up dogs. You put them in the pool. We let, I go let him out the pen and run around. My dog. I want to save his name to preserve his dignity. Because he's mounted in my house right now, <laughs> catching a hog. Anyway, okay. Those little floaties would be in the pool, just floating around. He'd come out, run out of the pen. He'd sit him in the pool. He'd run up to the edge of the pool, and he'd wait until the, to, to the, to the flow of the water or whatever, the wind would just push it to the side, and he'd grab that floaty, run over to the side, and then just molest it. <laughs> just molested that floaty and popped it. He didn't care that babies were sitting in the house crying over that thing. He didn't care. <laughs> I don't believe he ever repented. I think he's in hell. I really do. <laughs> we're called to treat people with respect. We're called to be kind. You know what? We're called to have manners. 
I tell people all the time, especially in, in my work, in line of it, when, when did you stop being a Christian? You know, one of the fruits of the Spirit is kindness. Animals don't have morals. They don't have manners. You can have a company over your house. That dog of yours will jump right up on the couch and go to licking himself. Right in front of everybody. Y'all act like y'all ain't never seen that. You know it's true. They'll get, a, they'll get a butt itch and they'll drag their butt all the way across the carpet in front of everybody. They don't care what you think. They don't care how you feel about it because they want their own desires. Men, we don't act like animals. You don't go around humping every woman you see. I feel like I'm at a men's conference. You, you come under self-control. We're not animals. The Bible says 275 times the Bible talks about beasts of the field. Beasts. We're not beasts. We're created in the image of God. We have the God-like character and nature on the inside of us. And listen, and apart from God, listen, because we had this thing, this argument with the LGBTQ, well, I was born this way. Listen, I was born into sin too. If left unchecked, I could fornicate. If left unchecked, I could be on drugs. If left unchecked, I could hate. If left unchecked, I could, I would not forgive nobody. But I, that's why you got to be born again. That's why you got to be reborn again. Salvation for the straight is the same thing it is for the gay. Because once you become born again, you put away all of those attributes. That's why we get born again. Okay, let me get the last one. Men don't act like boys. Boys cry for mama. Your wife is not your mama. <laughs> Don't be a drama queen. I'm working on that right now. My wife tells me I'm full of drama. I don't know where she's getting all that right now. I'm working on it. She told me this morning, she said, you just, you just drama-driven thing. You, I'm, I'm, I, where'd that come from? be full of drama. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. 1 Corinthians 13, but there came a day when I put away childish things and I became a man. Yeah. I began to act like a man. Hallelujah. You have a wife, you have children, you can't keep hanging around with all your buddies after work. Go home to your house. And when you go home, don't get on the video game. Help your wife at the house. Okay, let's just all stand before we fall out right here. Let's just stand. I'm, I, we better quit. I'm not done, but we better quit. Th this will be on the screen for you guys. In the back, help me with this last one. Maturity is never revealed, revealed by someone's age. Rather, it's revealed by their willingness to accept responsibility. You're only young once, but you can be immature for a lifetime. You're only young once, but you can be immature for a lifetime. We need men. And my heart, we're going we're, we're to work on some things. I'm telling you, my heart, my heart is exploding. We're, we're going to work, we're gonna work on men. We're going to work on women. We're going to raise godly families. We're going to have godly children. We're going to have it. This church is going to be full of men that are on fire for God. They're, they're not going to have to be reminded, hey, honey, it's church. You got to come on. No, they're going to say, listen, they're going to be waking up and say, honey, it's church time. Let's get the kids ready and let's go. Let's go. Three times a year they were summoned to come to a place of worship to remind them of what they were submitted to. I know all of us can't make it to church every Sunday. That's not what this is about. But you certainly ought to make more than you miss. Because it reminds the family, my heart is connected to God. See, some people have jobs that keeps them away for weeks or whatever. I get that. I'm not even talking about that. I'm just, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the attitude of your heart that says, I long to be in that place. The next generation needs us, men. 
And I thank God for every woman in this house because you carry a load that is beyond description. You make things happen that is just beyond mind-boggling when there's an absence of the man. You carry it. And I have nothing but the highest honor for you because you carry a lot. But we need men. Several years ago when, multiple years ago, 10 or 12 years ago when Vanessa was in South Africa going to school there at a leadership college, Karen and I would go over there and visit her and take supplies or whatever. And, and I got it. I got connections with an outfitter over there. And, uh, and he wanted to take us on safaris and take us in to the hunting portion of it. So we, we hunted a little bit while we were in South Africa. And I remember one day our guide, we were riding around and our guide was talking to us and he was explaining us different attributes about different animals and certain ways of survival in the jungle kind of thing. And he started talking about a gazelle and he said, a gazelle have a secret code or it has a sign for its little fawns. It's like a secret code. Uh, the, ma the, the mature gazelles, the mama and the daddies, if I could say it that way, have special spots or markings on the back of their ears. And the reason why these little God created it this way was so that when that mama or that daddy gazelle, I'm just going to use the daddy gazelle for now, is in that high brush where lions can ambush, when that, when, that, when that gazelle puts its head down to feed, the baby gazelle can't see it because it blends into the environment. It's, it's unseenable by the baby. But, but because of the alertness, be watchful. That's what our text said. When, when, when that male or that female mature gazelle saw approaching danger it would throw its head up as high as it could and would perk its ears up as high as it could and when the babies saw the distinctive marks on that mature gazelle it knew that something was approaching that was going to bring harm to us and it alerted them to be ready to run in a different direction I wonder how many dads in here, how many men in here have a marking on your life that when the little children, your children, when the generations around you, can they see that you've been marked by God? Can they see that there's a mark on your life that keeps them out of harm's way? Is there a mark on your life that when they look at you, they can follow you to safety? Listen, I, I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I'm a parent. I'm a grandpa. They call me papa. I, I, I've got all that. Listen, and I'm not perfect. I, I know I am probably the least of perfect people in this room. I get it. There's so many falls in my life, so many mistakes in my life. But I'll tell you one thing, and this is what I know, and it's straight from what I believe, and it's not to make me, make me look like something that I'm not. But there's one thing that my children will always be able to say about their daddy. He carried the mark of God, and he lived for God with everything he had, and he went after God with everything he had. He went one way in the pulpit and another way in society. He walked with God everywhere he went. Dad, that's the mark that you have to have on your life. Men, that's the mark that you need on your life. So when your little ones look at you, they see something different. They're not like everybody else. Because at the end of the day, you can make money. You can be successful. You know what really, you know what biblical success is? Is all your family make it to heaven. That's biblical success. Do your job. Make your money. Do all those things. Nothing wrong with it. Keep it in the right priority. But at the end of the day, when I get to heaven, I want to look around. 
And I want to see my family there. I want to see my children there. I want to see my grandchildren, maybe my great-grandchildren. I want to see some of my aunt, my aunts and my uncles. I want to see, I want to see all the people that, that I had the ability to live around. And let them know that I'm not sold out to the world. I don't live for the devil. I've got trial. I've got trauma. My family has been through some tough times. I'm not like anybody else, but at the end of the day, I'm going to follow on to know him. They need a mark. They need a mark. They need a mark of distinction to follow. They need something to be a living example. Some guys said something about Jesus' disciples. Said that We don't know everything about him, but we do know this. They have been with him. That's what we need. That's what we need. Can we just do this as a closing prayer? I'm not going to ask you to come to the front, but could I ask all the women, would you just sit down and let the men stand for a moment? Will you just do that? Will you just do that? Will you just help me look around this room? Look at all the men standing. Can we give God praise for some men? Every man in this building, you're a hero. You're a hero. Stay in alignment. Come on, let's pray. Father, I just speak over these men today. Anointed and appointed, gifted by God, called to serve, called to lead, calls to advance, calls to conquer, called to lead their family. God, I pray for an anointing of strength. I pray today for supernatural alignment today. God, call them into alignment. Call us into alignment. Call us back to a place where the power of God can be revealed, where the power of God can manifest. God, I, I may not have a whole lot to talk about, but I've got some things. I've got, I got, I got a wife. I've got a daughter. I've got a son. I, I've got some children. I've got some friends. I've got some influences. I've got some family. I've got some people around me. God, give me the strength. Give me the strength. Give me the strength. Now, ladies, if you don't mind, would you jump back up on your feet and just stand beside a man right there and just put your hand on their shoulder if you're your husband. Hug them however you want to, and let's just pray in prayer. Just come on. Can you say, God, I thank you for this man. God, I thank you for this anointing. God, I thank you for the characteristics of a godliness that's going to shine, that's going to blaze a trail for his family. Oh, come on. Can you just lift your voice in prayer? Can we just say, God, I thank you. Thank you for manly men. Thank you for men who act like men. Thank you for men who can stay the course. Thank you for men who understand the power of influence. And God, we're going to be like Joshua. I'm going to make a decision today just like Joshua did. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. Come on, man, can you say that? As for me and my house. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. My family may not be with me right now, but I'm going to give them a model. I'm going to give them an example. I'm going to give them something to look at. I'm going to have a mark of distinction over my life. Father, we thank you. Come on, we thank you. And we give you praise. Come on, one time. Just put your hands together. Let's bless the Lord. Let's bless the Lord. Woo, come on, let's bless his name today. Hallelujah. Last week, the covenant partners, you say, you know what? I want to be a part of this fellowship. 
I want to be a part of what God is doing here. If you want to be that, can you just come up here real quick? You say, I want to join this house. I'm going to join this church. This is where my heart is. If you were in that class, just make your way on down to the front. There was like seven or nine of them, whatever it was. We want to come on. Can we give praise for these guys? Come on, Matt. Hallelujah. Come on, guys. Come on. Come on. Amen. Amen. Hey man, this 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 is. I want to ask my wife. Come on, baby, just come up here with me real quick. I know the hour's late, but let me just say to you guys here. Come on, we we don't we don't have like membership here. We have covenant partners. Same thing as membership is semantics, but but we believe that people partner together in agreement to make a vision happen. That's what a covenant partner is. And you guys went through that class last week, and thank you for your time staying after and going through that class. But I want you to know that you bring completion to this vision. You bring completion to We're that much closer to everything that God's called us to be because of you. Because there's things in you that's not in some of us. There's things that you can do that some of us can't do. So God has called us together. We're coming out of the dating stage where we just show up, and we're coming into the marital stage. Where we come in covenant. We come in covenant when we partner together. So I just want to say these few things to you guys so that you'll know. First of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But we commit today. We commit to teaching you the word of the Lord. We commit to giving you instructions and to feed you the pure word of God. We commit to intercede for you. We commit to pray for you. We commit to provide protection for you. We're committed to stand by you in time of need, burden, or any personal crisis. I like to say it this way. You never fight by yourself. You'll never fight alone. you got a whole army, a whole family that will join with you. We also commit to correct you. We're committed to counsel you, advise you, or to correct you. Should you ever drift from the truth, we will provide for you what the Word teaches us, to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort, and to do that with all long suffering and with pure doctrine. We commit to be devoted to you. We're committed to love you and do our best to demonstrate that love to you, not just with our words, but with our actions. If you don't feel love from us, we got a problem. You need to feel it, not just hear it. And then lastly, we commit to receive you. We're committed to receiving you, to embrace you just as you are, but never leave you like you came. And so today, officially, we welcome you into the family of God. We welcome you to New Harvest Church. We love you. And this is something that we like to do here at New Harvest Church. We're, we're all fixing to leave. But if you could just turn around and just say hi to everybody. <laughs> I, just, I, I, want, I want you to give your names real quick and tell them how long you've been coming, and then we're going to do the fellowship thing. My name is Stacy, and I've been coming for about two, two and a half years. Uh, Jeffrey Willis. Uh, I came as a young teenager in high school, and I've been back now two years. How we doing? My name's Matt. Been here for a few months, four or five months. Isaac, been here for five plus years. Isaac's been here since the day he was old enough to know what church he is. We're so proud of him. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Hey, stay here, Jeffrey. Hold up, Jeffrey. Stay here, Jeffrey. Now, now this is what we're going to do, because I want everybody to welcome them. This is our family. These guys are our family. They're part of the family. Now we war, we fight together. So on our way out today, I want to dismiss you in prayer. But just as many as you can, come up here, love on these guys, hug on them, and let them know that you're so appreciative of them. Our church, this house, is much better because we got some new people that's going to partner with us. Amen. So, Father, I speak a blessing over your people. Lord, I thank you today as we go throughout our day. Lord, I thank you that you make us the head and not the tail. Everything that we touch, you will cause it to prosper. 
Lord, we give you honor today. Lord, I thank you today whoo, that men are rising. Thank you today, Lord, that heroes are in the house. There's some heroes in this house. And, Lord, we just give you all the praise and the glory for it now. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody together said amen. Amen and amen. God bless you.